of the forum. We have invited experts from regulatory bodies, financial institutions, fintech companies, ESG practitioners, and more to discuss how Hong Kong can embrace fintech to, discuss, to support ESG and promote green and sustainable finance. Let us welcome the moderator of the first panel, Mr. Mark Barnkow, Executive Director of University of Chicago, France and, Francis and Rose Yun Campus in Hong Kong, together with the following panelists, Mr. Kenneth Hui, Mr. Daniel Fong, Mr. Ben McQuay, Ms. Karen Lam, Ms. Mary Christine Lee to come on stage as well. I'm going to go ahead and get started um, while everybody takes their seat this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Barnico. I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago campus here in Hong Kong. But I'm also a, uh, before I came to Hong Kong, I was a uh, CEO of a uh, clean tech company. I think in today's terms, I would call it a supply, uh, a sustainable supply chain company. And it was a difficult uh, road to hoe, uh, being an entrepreneur in this space. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that today with one of our panelists. Um, U Chicago is committed to education and research regarding sustainable, uh, the sustainable climate. And um, some of the activities that we're doing here on campus include sustainability and climate. Um, it's a new theme for our campus. And we're going to be training more green entrepreneurs uh, as part of the new initiative, the strategic initiative that we have. So I wanted to mention that as one thing. Um, one of the relationships that spurred on this new initiative is our relationship with HKMA. Um, we are a knowledge partner of HKMA in the Alliance for Green Commercial Banks. So uh, we've already had some events with HKMA to educate more people about sustainability and ESG and greening up the, cl the climate, but we'll be doing a lot more of that in the future, hopefully bringing in uh, green interns from banks around Hong Kong and the region to train them on how to be um, innovative, more innovative in the work that they're doing. We'll also be doing some work in uh, Indonesia training young entrepreneurs in Indonesia. So I just wanted to give you a brief update on some of the U Chicago activities that we have going on here. But before I forget, I want to thank uh, Plato and the Friends of the Earth uh, for inviting me. I'm very honored to be moderating this uh, illustrious panel today. Um, I am fairly pessimistic, actually, when I look at some of the data. Uh, by 2010, we're going to exceed 1.5 degrees. Uh, by 2100, we're going to be in the 2.4 to 2.7 degree range in terms of exceeding uh, global warming. This is really concerning to me. Um, we're in a climate crisis now, and I think we all need to be focused on this effort on a daily basis, and this is such a great forum to be able to do this. Um, I am somewhat uh, uh, pleased to hear that and learn that JP Morgan recently committed um, $2.5 trillion to sustainable development, one trillion of which they'll be committing before 2030. That's good news. But at the same time, as we heard earlier, uh, there's more in increasing litigation and regulatory enforcement focused on allegations of greenwashing. So we all have to watch out very closely for that. Um, as we have already heard, this is the 53rd anniversary of uh, Earth Day tomorrow. And my role on this panel is incredibly difficult. Uh, this is a really complex topic. We have such great uh, panelists here today that we're going to hear from, and I'm going to do my best to try to manage uh, the conversation. Uh, what I would ask the panelists to do, um, and I know that we know some of the uh, acronyms, uh, ESG and so, so forth, but if, if you do get into some uh, more uh, deeper acronyms, if you could just explain the acronym or describe the acronym, in plain English for the audience, uh, um, if you use it for the first time. That would be fantastic. So without further ado, I want to introduce our panel, and I'll start uh, from my left uh, with Mr. Kenneth Huey. He's head of the Market Development Division of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Uh, he's in charge of the HKMA's efforts to enhance Hong Kong's competitiveness as an international financial center. I think we have a lot of uh, in-depth conversations for him. Uh, Daniel Fung, you've already met, uh, Vice Chairman, Financial Services Development Council. Uh, ben McQuay, he's uh, uh, told me he's uh, one of the longer standing uh, folks in this space since 2016. Uh, he's the Vice President of the Hong Kong Green Finance Association and founder of Ben McQuay and Company. 
Um, Ms. Karen Lam is Structured Finance and Derivatives Partner uh, at uh, Hong Kong SAR Linklaters. And finally, uh, Ms. Marie Christine Lee. She's the founder of Sports for Hope Foundation, and she is uh, one of the fellow entrepreneurs here on the panel that I'm excited to hear from today. So with that uh, brief introduction, let me go ahead and get started and turn the questions over to Kenneth first. Um, you know, there's been so much talk about ESG, sustainability becoming a central uh, issue for businesses uh, and companies and organizations. Uh, is HKMA doing enough? I guess that's my first question for you. What, what, what do you think your major accomplishments have been so far as a regulatory body? And then um, what more can be done? Well, thank you very much, Mark. And thanks a lot for um, the invitation today to Plato and also Friends of the Earth. Um, a lot needs to be done. Um, as Mark, you said earlier, there is really quite a big urgency and also the task is quite, quite wide-ranging and quite huge. Um, the HKMA or the government in general, uh, we're focusing on three key areas uh, to promote green finance and also more generally the greening of Hong Kong's financial system. The first is on supervision, uh, on making sure that we have clear rules and regulation in both uh, risk management as well as disclosure. We can talk about all these areas uh, in more details if we have time today. Um, second area is on ecosystem building. We spend a lot of time making sure that we have the right talent uh, to do the, this, this job and also to make sure that we have the relevant data, as many of you know, uh, both for risk management as well as for designing new products in finance as in my, many other areas, we need the right data. And this is a relatively new view, uh, both in terms of what we call physical risk, um, you know, landslides, typhoon, all these, the damage to Hong Kong's economy as well as the financial system, as well as when it comes to what we call transition risk, which is how companies and corporates, they are transitioning to a more sustainable future and the cause as well as the risk that is involved. The third area is awareness and also participation. Here, we're really counting on every one of you, um, making sure that we all contribute our part in um, bringing green finance to the broader public. Uh, in Hong Kong, we've done quite a few things. Um, Joseph mentioned earlier about the government green bond program. It's something that we hope to use to raise awareness, not just among institutions, but also among investors, as well as the public, actually. Uh, earlier last year, we launched a retail green bond program hoping to really bring the Hong Kong public on board this important area. So this is kind of broadly what we in the public sector have been doing. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Um, Daniel, I'm gonna to turn to you. Um, you know, sometimes I think we get to the point where uh, there, as I said earlier, a lot of acronyms, uh, a lot of language that people don't necessarily understand. Um, what are some of the other limitations of ESG reporting and how can the li limitations of ESG reporting be overcome so that the, the, the average business person really understands them, can embrace them and implement them? Um, you, you raise a, a, a very good point here because I, I, I think <clears throat> not just in Hong Kong but globally, um, we are drowned by jargon and we are, we are drowned um, also by statistics. Uh, which valuable though they are and essential as um, measures for progress or lack of progress, we need to translate all these terms into a language that is accessible and comprehensible by lay people because without um, participation from the grassroots, without participation from society at large, um, we run the risk of speaking in a little echo chamber or an ivory tower, whether in academia or in a think tank, and talking about ourselves. That is not good. So we really need to break out of this um, uh, sort of specialist paradigm. Because ultimately, the success or failure of all of these initiatives depends on a broad public participation and support. And I, I, I think we are very lucky or blessed in Hong Kong that we have a generally very highly educated and aware society. And because we're such a small place, necessarily we become very globalized because we look at international news, for example, so that we, we're not um, stuck in a, um, uh, a little parochial environment. I, I think the Nobel laureate uh, Gunnar Myrdal had something to say about this back in the 1950, 
where he observed that the United States um, is the most parochial society on earth because it's the most self-sufficient. Now, uh, conversely, we are one of the least self-sufficient uh, places on earth because we have no natural resources. The only resource we have uh, are our people and the talent that they bring to the table. So I, I think it's very important that the messaging speaks to the general environment as opposed to a specialist audience. I'm, I'm four square with you. Uh, be behind the, the, the push to avoid um, jargon, um, uh, like um, when, when we talk about global carbon emissions, why do we use an acronym? Why should we do that? Because it's self-evident. And why would we talk about SEEE -E -E when we're talking about a Shanghai uh, emissions market and, and so on? I don't want to take up more time, but I, I'm four square behind you that the communication and the messaging to the public at large and more broadly to the world at large is absolutely critical when one of our speakers earlier talked about um, villages in Madhya Pradesh, one of the poorest um, states in India, um, being as it were fintech um, um, cognizant, oh, that's the audience we should reach. Right. Oh, I love that comment. Thank you so much for that. Ben. Greenwashing. You seem to be our greenwashing expert on the panel, from what I can tell. Uh, maybe you've handled a few greenwashing cases yourself. How can organizations uh, avoid greenwashing in their reporting and um, or overcome the greenwashing accusation if they've actually been accused of doing it? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, that's a huge amount to unpack just there. So let me just try and skim over the surface of some of those uh, 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 themes. Um, let me just remark, you, you had asked me if I was a, a green finance old timer. And I said, I'm not sure about that, but I definitely feel old sometimes. And so uh, let me just clarify that. So back to greenwashing. Um, greenwashing in, in part is to, to address some of the points that Daniel and you have made about, so there's too much jargon. You know, what do we mean when we talk about environmentally friendly? What do we mean when we talk about recycled, recyclable, good for the planet, net zero, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at, at this stage, the evolution of greenwashing as we understand it is still very nascent. Um, greenwashing is a sort of multi-dimensional and, uh, and, and evolving problem that, that affects, in some cases, plagues sort of all financial centers, certainly any financial center that aspires to be a green international financial center. Um, at the same time, there's no universally accepted definition, which, of course, doesn't help. We, we tend to categorize greenwashing into sort of two, uh, two, two types. One we refer to as claim greenwashing, which is a bit more the obvious, where, where things are being said, things are being written. And then the other category is executional greenwashing, which is much more sort of nuanced, which is where sort of greenwashing by implication by the color of the background of an advertisement or the, the style of uh, design of an advert, for example. So to avoid greenwashing, organizations simply need systems in place. Okay, they need policies and procedures, such as uh, operating procedures, um, regular training, which is essential, um, you know, boards and um, um, sort of key decision makers, managers, need to be informed and educated with respect to the, to the risks the risks to themselves, of course, and there's a direct relationship between these, uh, between greenwashing risk and uh, directors' duties, and of course, risks to the uh, to the organisation. Latest trends and regulatory developments absolutely critical in an evolving uh, space. So, at the core of greenwashing, we have communication. Okay, it's the concept of communication, but it doesn't just impact ESG reporting; it impacts really all communications that companies. Um, and financial institutions, of course, make. So it covers marketing, advertising materials, public statements, labels, reps to shareholders, etc. And so in terms of um, overcoming greenwashing, well, the, 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 the key thing is to, um, or rather, transparency is always the best policy. When you're making statements that imply benefits to the environment or performance by reference to environmental and increasingly social metrics, it's very important to be truthful, to be accurate, clear, unambiguous, all very sort of you know, familiar themes. And perhaps most importantly of all, make sure you can substantiate your claims. So some of the, some of the most high profile sort of public naming and shaming 
in respect to greenwashing, financial institutions, airlines, has been in breach of advertising standards. And on the, the heart of those, um, uh, I suppose, uh, enforcement actions has been the inability to substantiate the claim that had been made. Um, shall I stop there? Because I know that uh, time's point. ticking. Please. One more point? Yes, I was just going to say that, you know, the question for most is, well, how, how do you tackle greenwashing? It's all well and good talking about it, but how do you go about doing it? So the policies and procedures, the systems that I mentioned a moment ago, these can be sort of internally managed and or externally supported, okay? Quant quantitative um, disclosures typically are externally verified and assured. Increasingly, particularly as ESG becomes a more regulated environment, then the quantitative, the qualitative, excuse me, e um, 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 disclosures will also be um, um, independently and externally uh, audited. Um, there's, of course, a hugely important role for regulators. Um, there's also a hugely important role for uh, ESG uh, ratings. Um, and, of course, organizations should give some thought to how to manage sort of this crisis management in the event of a claim or an allegation of greenwashing against them. And perhaps a very, very final point, because there's a fintech context to all of this. There are all sorts of fintech and technical <laughs> innovations and solutions to, to help address, if not solve, a lot of the problems associated with greenwashing. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. You've touched on so many things that are of interest to me, and I'm going to turn it over to Karen, but I wanted to make a couple points. Um, I've read some ESG reports, large corporate ESG reports, startup ESG reports. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed by what I read because it, it looks like word salad to me. And there's not enough quantitative. It's always like a footnote at the back of the corporate uh, report. And it seems to me that a lot of firms are, you know, uh, almost using templates to create ESG reports. And I know they're doing it in collaboration with the corporations, but um, one thing that we were talking about earlier and in my research uh, uncovered the number 23 taxonomies that are being used around the world and every country in Asia has its own taxonomy. Can you talk a little bit about taxonomies, standardization, and the actual reporting requirements, the regula regulatory and policy frameworks that are out there that can help companies uh, basically comply in a way that's meaningful. Thanks, Mark. Yes, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, ESG disclosure and reporting first. So um, I, I agree that um, I think given this is such a new thing um, for many companies, uh, people are grappling with um, how to, um, you know, compile the data and um, how to re report. But I think we are seeing um, more standardization and more granularity um, over time. And um, I, I think um, there are a couple of things uh, worth mentioning here. Um, ESG data that comes from these uh, reporting regimes will help ensure transparency so that uh, investment in sustainable finance uh, can be channeled to areas that will truly help us reach net zero and other ESG targets. And um, in that sense, Hong Kong authorities have implemented uh, ESG disclosure regimes on um, certain uh, people already, such as listed issuers, banks, and fund managers. And I know these um, requirements are being refined over time uh, to um, match international standards that are um, being developed. So for example, there's the International Sustainability Standards Board, um, they are um, setting international standards on sustainability disclosure, which um, will be equivalent uh, to the accounting standards uh, such as IFRS, but in the sustainable space. Um, so I think the challenge here is for uh, the Hong Kong regulators to um, try as much as possible to adhere to international standards, but taking into account um, you know, the, the stage um, where local companies are at and uh, try to come up with something that is both ambitious, but as th at the same time actionable by companies. And um, I think we're talking here about, um, uh, you know, for ISSB, uh, you know, a lot on risk monitoring, ESG risk monitoring, about um, governance, developing strategies and transition plans um, to achieve their ESG goals, and a very uh, detailed um, data on their um, carbon emissions generated by their own business, as well as um, even their suppliers. 
Um, and I think um, at the moment, uh, some of this data is, is difficult to collect and maybe FinTech is there to, to assist companies to uh, deal with that challenge. But um, I think we, you know, we're certainly seeing a lot of development in this area. Um, the, the other point I want to touch upon is um, green loans and green bonds, as well as sustainability um, linked uh, financial products such as loans, bonds and derivatives. And um, here I think um, uh, what Mark mentioned about taxonomy uh, comes into play. So um, taxonomy is basically a classification system that um, tells people or, or that designates certain um, areas as green and others as non-green. But um, the issue is that different countries and jurisdictions are coming up with their own taxonomies. And uh, so there are different standards being applied and uh, it, it makes it difficult for investors investing in um, uh, you know, investments in other countries when these standards don't match. So um, uh, I think uh, Joseph Chan mentioned the common grand taxonomy which actually is a mapping exercise of the taxonomy between um, EU and China. And that is a very good starting point. And I know Hong Kong is also looking at that and trying to adopt that as part of its own um, uh, taxonomy system. And um, I think having convergence uh, in taxonomies while at the same time, um, you know, having respect to local differences will help um, in cross-border finance. And uh, so my firm has worked on a number of uh, green bond uh, issuances over the past few years. And a number of them already now um, have reference to the common ground taxonomy. Um, so that, for example, um, green bonds that um, use proceeds for investment in China can um, satisfy both the Chinese taxonomy as well as um, the EU taxonomy where a lot of the investors are based. And um, I think um, as today's focus is on fintech, I'd also like to quickly man uh, mention the tokenized um, green bond that I think Joseph, Mr. Joseph Chan also talked about just now. Um, so our firm also helped with that issuance. And I uh, just want to mention that um, the use of tokenization actually helped um, shorten the settlement time frame for that bond issuance to one day. Um, which is much shorter than what you would normally see for other bond issuances. Um, so again, this is an area where we think um, FinTech can help to promote green finance. And um, I think uh, the Hong Kong regulators are also expecting to issue more guidance around uh, tokenized securities later this year. Um, one final point on carbon markets. Um, so I think um, here at the moment, Hong Kong, um, again, as mentioned by some other speakers, we've uh, launched the core climate carbon trading platform. This is largely a voluntary um, carbon trading um, platform at the moment. So um, Hong Kong doesn't have a lot of regulations around this. Um, however, it does adhere to international best practice, and I think it remains to be seen whether some of the international initiatives are sufficient to ensure that um, the voluntary carbon credits are of sufficiently high standard and that um, carbon offsetting is used in a way um, that you know, doesn't promote greenwashing and that really s helps companies to satisfy their um, net zero targets. Um, but I think one thing here that maybe um, uh, regulators and the government can do is um, to provide more legal certainty around the um, legal nature of carbon credits. And um, so I think uh, a lot of people in the market take the view that uh, carbon credits, uh, voluntary carbon credits should be treated as a kind of intangible property. But unfortunately, in a lot of jurisdictions, um, including Hong Kong and China, um, there isn't the definitive legal statement that you would find in case law or legislation that supports this. So um, I think having that legal certainty will really help to scale up the carbon markets, both in Hong Kong and um, elsewhere. Okay, thank you. All right. Marie-Christine Lee, fellow entrepreneur. Um, one thing I would like to say before you get started is here we are in Cyberport. I don't know how many startups there are in Cyber Cyberport. Every one of them should be complying to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Every one of them should have a social impact mission. Every one of them should create that mission statement as they get started. 
it's so hard to sh turn the ship when you have a major corporation. And I was so inspired by Marie Christine when I first talked to her about her Sports for Hope Foundation and her other initiative she's going to talk about today. Turn it over to you, Marie Christine. Let's give you a mic that works. Right. I mean, um, in the vibrant city of Hong Kong, we're described as being highly westernized, except with much stronger emphasis on traditional va family values, education, and financial successes. However, sports to me, it's just as important. Um, that's why I'm passionate about sports, and I think um, sports you know, gives me so much positivity, energy, um, and, um, you know, uh, discipline, etc. So that's how I got started with my foundation back in uh, 2010. Um, as I grew older, I realized that um, sports wasn't just a personal passion, it's a way to help others too. So I noticed that many young um, people here in Hong Kong, especially uh, on the, those underprivileged sector in Hong Kong, um, they, they have very little access to sports training, sports facilities, um, etc. So, and I know how important sports is um, to them. Um, meaning not just physically, but also with the mental well-being. So that's how I, um, you know, in 2010, I started, uh, you know, to take action and to try to do something back to the society. And a little bit, a bit of background why sports, you know, because I'm very, very privileged to, to have grown in this extremely privileged family with my own tennis court and swimming pool. Um, that's how I got, you know, um, my passion in sports uh, throughout my childhood. Um, so when I started this foundation called Sports for Hope Foundation back in 2010, um, I had to make awareness to the society. As we all know, Hong Kong thinks that sports is only secondary to um, to, to education, rather. Um, so to me, it was a big challenge to educate the public about the importance of uh, sports. Um, and uh, therefore, I, um, I, I, I did an expedition on the Silk Road, challenging myself um, on a 500-kilometer, um, three-day cycling on the Silk Road. Actually, the exact location was, uh, we started at Sumahana. Um, that was at the border between China and Kyrgyzstan. And then finishing in Kaska in Xinjiang region. So um, I rode through, you know, rocky roads, muddy grounds, um, uh, different terrains, um, uh, high altitude mountains of 3,000 meters to, to the desert, experiencing um, nasty, you know, four seasons weather changes. Um, I successfully did it. The whole point was to ultimately demonstrate uh, to the whole of Hong Kong that I wasn't an athlete. Um, as long as you are committed uh, with the perseverance, um, and the teamwork, because I rode with a few other athletes, um, everyone can succeed. And I completed it in three days, and I managed to raise uh, Hong Kong dollars, eight million, to kickstart my foundation. And, um, and that eight million, I um, created a pilot project uh, called the Sports Legacy Scheme, and that was a collaboration with the um, Hong Kong Olympics um, Committee, uh, Hong Kong, China. And um, that was to demonstrate the Olympism behind uh, sports, which helped to, to build strong minds, discipline, leadership, confidence, sense of belonging, equality, 
cultural diversity through sports. And um, the target was um, to target those financially in need secondary schools, mainly in the northern district of Hong Kong, and those who are the underprivileged uh, children. Um, and uh, a very large portion of them uh, are uh, cross-border uh, students uh, from Shenzhen. Um, and we provide uh, retired athletes um, to pursue, well, at the same time, the, the retired athletes, they pursue the passion for sports, the, the giving back to the school by introducing multi-sports uh, to, the, to the children. And also, um, you know, with uh, sports talents identification. Um, so it was a win-win situation, and uh, the fact that um, the 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 retired coaches can give back to to the society at the same time they can develop their uh, career in coaching, and uh, definitely big uh, beneficial, um, uh, you know. Uh, for the children as well uh, through this whole program. So um, as we continue to thrive on this, um, you know, uh, a scheme, uh, we I had to organize a multiple fundraising programs and awareness out to in order to expand to other you know funding uh, programs. Um, so this part is something very interesting that I'm going to talk about because with um, with my continuation believing in sports, how important sports is to our society to make life better for everyone. Um, I, um, last year, that was 2022, um, I wanted to use this foundation as a platform to help, uh, I found an opportunity, let's say, um, to improve the environment. Um, through a recycling initiative called Afterlife, Just As Beautiful. Um, this was about collection and recycling of tennis balls. So, uh, of abandoned tennis balls. Believe it or not, I mean, tennis balls are really abandoned <laughs> badly um, throughout the world. I mean, the number is astronomical. It's like 325 million abandoned tennis balls throughout the world. Um, Hong Kong is a small number, but you know, but still, like about two to three million abandoned tennis balls. Would you like to show the video that you brought with you? Um, yes, I would like to. After I finished my okay. yeah, how I got this started. Okay. <laughs> So this would be the first sports, um, consumable in sports sector in, in, in Hong Kong. So the objective uh, is to raise consciousness of sustainability um, through various sports games. So with a bit of creativity, um, I, um, I brought in my cousin Douglas, uh, who's the founder of GOD, and then he created uh, a, a few very interesting furniture pieces out of these abandoned balls. And my son Alistair here, he's sitting there. Um, he created an animated, hand-drawn um, video um, to, uh, to basically uh, to explore the philosophy and the motivation behind this whole initiative. So we're gonna show that video after I finish okay. off this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we did a two weeks exhibition on this um, initiative and it was extremely successful. Um, we, we got the awareness out to the, the society as well as uh, the, the environmental department. Um, a lot of the part, private clubs, um, uh, sports associations, and they were very, very excited uh, about this whole thing. So in February of this year, um, I was very blessed to receive a two years grant from the Hong Kong EPD Environmental Protection Department and Hong Kong PC um, uh, under a new program called Recycle Your Tennis Balls. So right now, uh, we have designed our own collection bins and it's, it's all spread out into 50 plus locations here in Hong Kong. 
uh, including majority of the big private recreational clubs, as well as some of the LCSD sites in Hong Kong. So we're going to co collect these balls and um, send them to one of the biggest local recycling company called OFLO, and they're going to break these tennis balls into uh, rubber crumbs and rubber powder, and they will be downcycled into rubberized paving blocks, rubber pads, like the, the ones just you see uh, in the children's playground, um, you know, in the government children's playground. And this is very interesting too, you know. Um, also, the crumbs will be, will be burned into rubber-derived fuel to be used by um, this company called Green Island Cement um, as an alternative fuel for the machines. Um, yep, so this is how I, you know, got involved with the environment now. So now you can see the movie. Thanks so much. <laughs> Let's have a look at the movie. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And also just your perseverance in making all of that happen, Marie-Christine. That's really just a great story. Um, now, we don't have a lot of time left, uh, but what I'd like to do, I have some questions, uh, and I'm going to start, and whoever wants to take the mic to answer the question, um, please you know, raise your hand, we'll pass you a mic. Um, I'm interested in best practices. Uh, I'm interested in what governments in Asia have the best practices. I'm interested in, give me a name of a company, corporation, an NGO that you think has best practices and explain why. Who wants to go first? Um, could, I, um, could I just artfully avoid that question for a sec? Because I think, um, Maria Christine, Marie, I think, I think you, you put a very important spotlight on this, the social aspect of, of ESG. We, we, we talk in Hong Kong, when we when we when we sort of talking ESG, we, we tend to be mainly talking about climate, and and when we talk about sort of green finance, we're talking mainly about sort of sort of high finance products, ways that we can sort of immediately instantly make money, products and things that are immediately and instantly bankable, whereas for you know for for a lot of the money that we need to 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 move to have a, a hope of tackling climate change and dealing with the sort of social issues attributed to climate change, we, we have to move a lot of, we have to come up with a lot more innovative ways to direct money to, to more sort of social um, uh, projects. And so blended capital is something that's massively important that we don't really talk about that much in Hong Kong. Um, you, you mentioned about the important grant money and, and um, Under Secretary Chan talked earlier a little bit as well about um, some of the um, sort of funding schemes the government has. It's really important that we have a clear line of sight as to where those pockets of cash are so that we encourage more people, more entrepreneurial spirit 
who can actually go out there and bring to market their solutions that should be, if it works in Hong Kong, it's going to work elsewhere. And we're really looking at scalability to, to enhance um, acceleration. I'll say very, very quickly on, on, on uh, best practices. It, it's such a moving target. It's, it's really hard. And I'm not sure that anyone wants to really name and shame. But I think, um, Daniel, you mentioned in your opening remarks about sort of gold standards. I think in Hong Kong, we tend to assume that, you know, we, we take a lead in by, by reference to other key markets, you know, whether it's the EU or the US or, or UK. And I think in the area of sustainable finance, because there are topics that are, or, or uh, characteristics that are very unique to Hong Kong in our role as an international financial center in China, that we, we actually should be and could be a lot more ambitious and actually set standards. Thank you. Dan Daniel, you want to respond to that? And then yeah, I have a question, I, another I, question for follow on for you. I, I, I think um, we're on the cusp of a major change here because whereas um, obviously we've, we've looked in the past to um, other references like the EU, like Canada and so on for uh, how they've done things. And we recognize there's no need to reinvent the wheel and start from scratch. Um, today, uh, there's a growing recognition that we stand on the cusp of a new synthesis, which given uh, the way carbon trading has developed in China uh, since 2008, and, and, and given the understanding that they need to globalize, internationalize, and use Hong Kong as the springboard uh, for that type of globalization, and, and given the recognition that you can price uh, carbon credits uh, in RMB as opposed to, let's say, US dollars. And, and given that there is a huge push to internationalize RMB, and uh, uh, clearly Hong Kong is the leading offshore RMB trading center, and we are in some ways streets ahead of both Singapore and London, and that gap will grow. Um, we solve uh, a number of different pro problems at the same time. Um, one, how to have a globalized, equitable, transparent, um, and measurable carbon trading market. Secondly, how to um, help R&B uh, internationalize so that we don't uh, rely on just one single currency for uh, global trade. Um, th this we can do, and the uh, beginning is now. So um, I, I think in answer to the question, whether we will keep looking at, uh, as it were, European standards or Canadian standards, let's say, the answer probably is not. Uh, we'll be creating our, our own synthesis. And in that process, we all have a role to play. This is not a top-down thing. This is very much a horizontal uh, process. And the recognition by Beijing that the eight different carbon trading markets in China are domestic. Uh, they are uneven in terms of practices and standards. They want a global market, and Hong Kong is the only game in town. Uh, and so really the game is ours to lose. Uh, and we uh, have a huge opportunity here to do something truly meaningful and to add value to the global uh, debate on combating uh, climate change. Great, thank, thank you, you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, ben, Karen, M Marie, Christine, you get the last words, okay? Any final thoughts you wanna leave us with? We only have a couple minutes left. I'll start with Ben on my left. I'm sorry, not Ben, Ken Kenneth, oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just riding on your, your final question about best practice, um, I think, I think in, in green, in climate change, we need to kind of really think further about how we see this. Um, when it comes to green finance, it's really based on the real economy, uh, based on how different jurisdictions deal with climate change, deal with their own environmental problem. And because there's such diversity across jurisdiction, different jurisdiction, how they deal with climate change is really, um, there, there could be a different solution. And as a result, um, green finance across different jurisdictions can also differ by quite a lot. So I guess my point is that when in the pursuit of best practice, we also need to be mindful about how different jurisdictions could have a legitimate reason to differ. Um, and I think going back to Ben's point about you know, how disclosure is useful, 
uh, allowing people to make their own judgment. I think that could also be a way out. Great, thank you. Karen, you're next. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would echo what uh, Ken said. And um, basically, I, I think um, uh, after the big bang of the COP26 in, in Paris, where people set very ambitious goals, I think this year, um, a, a lot of people are looking at transition, um, you know, the, the journey to reaching um, that goal. And I think every company is starting at a different place. Every country is starting at a different place. And the important thing is to look at where we are at and what needs to be done to achieve that. And the pathway to achieving that goal for every company or, or country or, or, or region um, could be different. But I think that the key thing is to have that uh, common goal and to work consistently towards that. And um, that, that's why we have these international bodies where we're exchanging uh, best practices, but at the same time, um, each company and country and region needs to come up with um, the, the you know, um, a most suitable plan for itself in reaching that target. Thanks, Marie-Christine. Final inspirational words for people who want to be entrepreneurs and do something great for the planet like you're doing. Yeah, you just have to be passionate. You have to persist and um, believe in it. And um, I think you, Hong Kong, we need a lot more education, like in terms of um, particularly the area of my interest in sports. Um, we need to educate people, you know, on this and um, I need more funding. <laughs> yeah, so. So the government yeah. could provide more funding for yeah, this I hope they education. Can. Sure, yeah. Great, thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs>